Welcome, everybody. N nice to see everybody. And it's a pleasure to welcome back Dr. Naomi Seidman, who spoke really at the beginning of Zoom, uh, way back in uh, the height uh, when everybody was mamash, mamash locked down uh, back in 2020. And of course, she was the author, uh, the author of a, a trailblazing book on the history of the Beis Yaakov movement. So now we're going to do a little bit uh, of follow up. She is the Chancellor Jackman Professor of the Arts in the Department uh, for Study of Religion and Center for Diaspora and Transitional Studies, that's a mouthful, at the University of Toronto. Basically, she's a professor at U of T, University of Toronto, of course, where, where I live, and uh, a Guggenheim Fellow. She uh, is, as I mentioned, her other publications include uh, Faithful Renderings, Jewish-Christian Differences in the Politics of Difference, The Marriage Plot, How Jews Fell in Love with fell in love with love and with literature. And uh, her book on the Beis Yaakov movement won the National Book Award in Women's Study. And uh, it's a really a pleasure to welcome her back. Even though she teaches at University of Toronto, she's spending the summer in California. So she's, uh, it's a little bit earlier for her. It's only only 10 o'clock in the morning, but uh, a pleasure to welcome you back. Vakasha, Dr. Naomi. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Kelman. And maybe I'll give, in a, I'll give a plug for our event in March. I forget exactly March what, but we're gonna have an event um, at Rabbi Kelman Synagogue that's gonna be the first international conference on the history of Beis Yaakov. Um, and it, there'll be part of the conference will be on campus and part of the conference will be at the synagogue. And we have people coming and talking about Sarah Schneer's Polish diary which is uh, you know, an amazing, important find. Um, we have people talking about Beis Yaakov in North America today, Leslie Ginsberg Klein, who I think many of you must know, who's a superstar. Anyway, um, so today I, I put forward an idea for what I would talk about, and I'll talk about that for a minute, but I'm hoping to also have time to talk a little bit about Tuba'av because, um, I actually, when we signed up August 8th, I didn't correlate it with the Jewish calendar. I didn't realize it was right in this moment between Tisha B'Av and Tuba B'Av. And Tuba B'Av, I think Beis Yaakov has a really important uh, thing, you know, role in the revival of um, Tuba B'Av in the modern period. And I would love to have time to talk about that for a minute. So I'm just saying that so that I, I, I save myself 10 minutes at some point toward the end to talk about another topic. But let me share my screen right now and tell you, or let me tell you what I'm about to show you. So even though I finished my book and it was published in 2019, um, hanging out in archives is, is a terrible habit, is a, is a kind of addiction and um, to go to an archive and look for stuff. It's, I don't know if any of you have my interest in thrift stores. It's very similar, like a good thrift store and a good archive. Um, you, you, you know, it's like you never know what you'll find. Sometimes you'll find something really great. And even though the book is already done, I keep going to archives and I keep finding stuff. And I found something really fabulous in, in Warsaw um, when I was there in June. And I just wanted to share it with you. And I, I barely had time to look at it. It's very typical at archives that you get something and you get a photo or you take a photo with your phone and then you know you have it. And when you look at it, I, I made this the opportunity to look at it. Like, so what exactly do I have? And I thought I would share it with you and we would try to figure out together what it means to look at an artifact. So I'm about to show you one artifact that I got in Warsaw. And then as I was preparing this Friday, I get an email from David Berenbaum. Does anybody know who David Berenbaum is? So how many of you actually are Toronto based? Uh, you put it in the chat box, I guess. I, I'll, I'll look through the list and I'll try okay. to give you a so number. So one of the things, so for those of you who live in Toronto, you should know that Toronto is home to probably the most interesting family, Jewish family archive in the world. And um, more specifically, the most interesting Orthodox Jewish family archive. What I mean is an archive that somebody has in their basement, but don't get the wrong idea. This is a major archive. And, um, and if you, 
know of an Orthodox millionaire who wants to help professionalize the best family archive in the world, please email me because I would love to see it uh, in a library somewhere. And David is already in his late 80s. So David Berenbaum, who's the family archivist, is the grandson of Nathan Berenbaum, Nutzen Berenbaum, who was an important Zionist. Um, he coined the term Zionism, actually. And then he was an important Yiddishist. Um, who helped found the, the who who had the first international conference on Yiddish in Chernovitz, and then um, became a Balchuva, an Orthodox Jew, um, already in I forget how old he was um, in 1911. So and he became very involved with the Aguda. So the archive contains all kinds of other all kinds of fascinating material about Orthodoxy. Um, Nathan Berenbaum was the executive secretary of the Agudas Yisrael, the organized political movement of, of Orthodox Jewry. And his son, Shlaima Berenbaum, also a man who wore many hats, the first Yiddish professor in, in Europe, but also a great fan of Beis Yaakov. And the family archive has many, many photos of um, Beis Yaakov, including photos of Beis Yaakov in 1930, um, and another brochure about Beis Yaakov during the summer holidays of 1930 in a town that I visited when I was in Poland um, because I'm making a documentary film about Beis Yaakov. But that's a whole other story that maybe I'll tell you if you have any questions you could um, ask me. I'm not actually making it. My friend who's a filmmaker is making it. We're making it together. But let me start with the first. So. So what I wanna do is use the material from um, 1930 to talk about what um, we have photographs from 1930 and we have a newspaper account from 1932 that will give you a sense of what Tuba Av was in Beis Yaakov. I actually believe that it's very possible that Sarah revived um, Tuba Av in the modern period. And if I'm wrong about how she revived Tuba, at least I'm not wrong that she revived it in the Orthodox world. Okay, so that's my too long introduction and let me share my screen. Um, and let me show you this artifact. So um, here, this is better. Um, this is the brochure. It's around a 15, 20 page brochure. I go to an archive, how do I do it? I go to the search engine, I type in Beis Yaakov, which can be harder than you think, because if they don't have Hebrew, then how you spell Beis Yaakov in Poland, whatever, there's a lot of different ways. Um, how you spell Sarashner, also there's many different ways. Um, Beis Yaakov is a lot of different things other than the girls' school system. Um, but every once in a while, you hit a bullseye and you get something like this. And what this is, who knows exactly? It looks like a kind of publicity brochure, um, multilingual. So it's in how many languages? It's in five languages. That's one of my questions. Why is it in five languages? It's in Yiddish, Hebrew, English, German, and Polish. And it's about a school called Ohel Sara. And Ohel Sara, and it's from it's published in 1937, as you can see in Lodge. Now, Ohel Sara, let me tell you a little bit about it. What is Ohel Sara? Um, from what I gleaned, partly from the brochure and partly from other sources I had, Ohel Sara began as a, um, a what was called a, a Hachshara Kibbutz, which means a um, a uh, what, what would you call it, a kind of educational kibbutz or a planning kibbutz, a professional kibbutz. Uh, uh, um, the word, the, the exact word is, is escaping me, a training kibbutz, let's call it, where girls lived communally in preparation for making aliyah um, to Israel. And one of the interesting things about this um, brochure is that it complicates the notion that as, as a, a, a school that's under the, or as a group or whatever you want to call it, you see, it's not clear exactly what, what we're talking about, a school, a kibbutz, a training institute, a vocational educational program. Um, 
a, a communal living situation that um, that Beis Yaakov as this entity or Ohel Sara as this entity under the officially anti-Zionist Agudas Yisrael still gets a kind of note of approval in the brochure from two representatives of the Sukhnut, the Jewish agency, the Zionist agency um, that was sending people to Palestine, thanking Beis Yaakov for supporting the Zionist cause. So in case you think we understand what orthodoxy was, of course, we know it was anti-Zionist. Apparently, it was not entirely anti-Zionist in every way, or at least it got some kind of approval from the Zionist establishment. And we also have a list of 70 girls who were sent to Tel Aviv as part of a kibbutz there. Um, and we have the list of names, which is really amazing, uh, as I'll show you, um, who made Aliyah in 1934. Now, um, this is a very complicated situation. It wasn't the easiest thing. It was complicated for girls and it was complicated for Orthodox Jews because there, was a, there weren't enough certificates given by the mandate government. And there was huge competition for the few certificates there were. So how a Orthodox girls uh, program, um, we're talking 15, 16, 17 year old girls or young women, if you wanna be more PC, how they managed to get 70 certificates is another interesting question because they had to fight not only the Zionist establishment that wasn't happy to give it to anti-Zionist Orthodox Jews, and there's a lot of negotiations around that, they also had to fight the Orthodox establishment because the Gera Rebbe said, okay, we'll send some of the boys. Um, whether the girls can get to go is a different question. So this was a, a politically successful um, attempt to send Orthodox Jewish young women to Palestine on these certificates given by the Polish government, by the British government. Let me show you some more of the uh, brochure. So Ohel Sara, there's a picture of Sara Schneer. It's actually a drawing. Um, Sara Schneer didn't allow her photograph to be shown as I talked about. Um, Sara Schneer visited the, uh, died in 1935. So by this time she was already two years uh, gone. You can see after her name, Alea Shalom, of blessed memory. Um, and But they have a little a blurb from her that she wrote in the guest book when she visited the, um, the, the when it was still a kibbutz in 1934. Um, and so we know that she, uh, she was there and it was renamed the Tent of Sarah after her death. Now, I just wanna say something about the name Ohel Sarah. And please, if you have something to say, because your faces are now very small, I don't necessarily see the chat. Jay, do you mind? Uh, monitoring, telling me someone has a question and also just yeah. unmute yourself and interrupt me because otherwise I could just keep talking. Yeah. Generally, almost... we leave the question to the end unless there's something urgent or you want to okay. ask a question to the people. I always just leave it to the end. Okay, okay. So Ohel Sarah is an interesting, a typically interesting name because Ohel Sarah is, was the name of what became by 1935 after Sarah Shanira's death, it was decided that it would be renamed for her and that it would become a vocational training program for girls in Poland. So not just girls going off to Palestine, but um, an educational program to study um, various trades in the morning and then um, to do Jewish studies in the afternoon, the opposite of how we did it in Mein Beis Yaakov. So the reason why Ohel Sara is so interesting is because Ohel Sara is a, um, is a code, a slogan in the Orthodox world for um, female modesty. So when, when people talk about female modesty and they try to find biblical proof that in the Bible, women also were modest, they wore you know, long dresses and whatever they wore in the ancient Near East. Then they say, we know that Sarah, was, the biblical Sarah was modest because when the angels came to visit Abraham, they said, where's your wife? And he said, Hineba Ohel, she's in the tent. So a woman doesn't go out and talk to angels, you know, outside, she stays in the tent. 
So the reason why this is a slightly ironic, but not entirely ironic name for this is because this was a, um, a program to educate working girls. So to, to provide working girls with an education. Let me just go through the brochure really quickly and I'll stop my share and I can see you. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how this is in Yiddish, the goals of Ohel Sara, very important for my purposes, but I'll summarize them at the end after I go through the brochure. There you see on the bottom right, I don't know if you can see so well, um, those girls have sewing machines. Very um, important and I don't wanna give you the wrong impression. So I'll talk a little bit about what it means for those girls to have sewing machines. And of course, Sarah Schneer herself had been a seamstress. So just wanna point that out. Um, but sewing was not the only thing you could learn in, um, uh, in Oh Health Sarah. You could also learn bookkeeping and social work and early childhood education. And um, I'm trying to see what that is. There's a, another workstation there. I think it's also for dressmaking. Um, but there on the top is the Jewish studies. They're listening to a lecture. And there they're also learning. Um, there's the, the kitchen, the kosher kitchen. They also learn um, what we used to call home economics, which I don't think they teach in schools anymore. Um, there's Sarshnir on the left giving her um, uh, her, her little blurb, uh, her, 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 her letter of recommendation. And there's um, on the right, I didn't do the whole story. There's the, you could see the end of the list of 70 girls who went to Palestine in 1934, the first kind of group of alums to start an Orthodox urban kibbutz in Tel Aviv in 1934. Um, there's a class photo, always part of an indoor one and an outdoor one. I had a hard time trying to make out that slogan, but it's not a typical Beis Yaakov slogan. Uh, oh, Hel Sarah, as a place that trained not teachers, but workers, female workers, found its own slogans. So um, that's of interest to me. And um, I have to do further work on that. Um, here's a Polish description by a Dr. Jay Schlosser. Figure out who that is. There's a picture of the, what they called the capacious dormitory where the girls are really sleeping basically side by side by side. Um, here's the English, which looks like it was translated from Polish. Um, as you can see, not by a native speaker, but here the question of productivization of the masses became very urgent for the Jews in general in connection with the extermination policy against Jews in almost all countries, but particularly important because this question became this question for the Jewish religious woman in Poland. So they didn't have Google Translate back then, so you can't blame it on that. But uh, very, like what exactly they meant by the extermination policy, very chilling. Um, and what productivization is a politically loaded uh, term that we also need to unpack. Um, and, and this, I'll just give you a little foretaste. This is what David Birnbaum sent me uh, on Friday, an amazing picture of the summer home of Beis Yaakov in 1930. Um, another picture, I was actually, uh, I don't know if you could see, but there's uh, these on the right side of that building to the left of your screen, there's a, uh, um, a porch that kind of juts out from the building. I stood on that porch about uh, six weeks ago and took photos of the hill with these girls and uh, women on it. And um, we, the building is still standing. The town is still beautiful. Um, uh, there's a picture of Judith Rosenbaum that we talked about two years ago. She's wearing white. She and uh, Irene Berenbaum, who's uh, Salman Berenbaum's, Shlema Berenbaum's wife and David Berenbaum's mother, um, are both wearing white on the left of the screen. And there you can see another photo in Ravka. So that's my slideshow. I'm gonna stop the share and tell you what I make of the, um, 
uh, of the uh, of the brochure. But before I start, well, just to hear other people's voices for a minute, why do you think it's in five different languages? Any guesses? I wanted to raise money. Absolutely. I don't know who that was. Eli? Yes. Ellie? Um, this is almost certainly a fundraising brochure. And thank God for fundraising, not necessarily because it's always so successful, but because it's a source of um, information. Though because it's fundraising, the information is not necessarily always so reliable. Um, so a lot of the material I find is, is for instance, in the Joint Distribution Archive, uh, a joint, joint Distribution Committee Archives in New York, which is all online, by the way, if you want to see what it's like to be in an all online and a digitized archive, it's really just a pleasure. Though they're always, they spell Beis Yaakov in 12 different ways, and I don't think they have a Hebrew search button. So it's, all, it's also very frustrating. But the Joint Distribution Archive was a major um, supporter of Beis Yaakov. And Beis Yaakov, you know, basically the material is always, please give us money. You don't give, you give the boys more money than the girls, which is true. They also managed to help get visas for the boys and the, bo the girls who were saved by these visas to Shanghai to get out of uh, war-torn occupied um, Poland and Lithuania had to get on these visas by begging the boys to marry them in fictitious marriages. But that's another story. So basically what you're talking about is a kind of fundraising enterprise. What do you think are the pitfalls of fundraising enterprises as sources of historical data? You said they're not, they're not actually accurate and they pretty things up or they slide over things. They present a vision that they want to present to get money, not necessarily what is actually going on. Exactly. So one of the things that is interesting about Beis Yaakov is that their fundraising base is not the same as their student base. So in other words, their student base is poor or middle class, lower middle class Orthodox Jews. Their fundraising base is much richer American Jews, much less Orthodox. So in other words, the less Orthodox audience has a, you know, has a way of shaping the narrative. So in other words, for the from, the from parents, but this brochure I actually think is playing both games because they're also telling the from parents why they should send their daughters here. They're telling the from parents, and the from parents want to hear one story, which is, we'll keep your daughters from. And the rich Jews in America want to hear, um, we're solving the economic problems of Europe. And the truth, or, you know, of, of an impoverished society. So Ohel Sir is playing a very interesting kind of game. And actually, and there, don't forget, there's also the Zionists in the crowd who are happy to hear that, oh, look at these Orthodox Jews, they're participating in the revival of the land of Israel. So you manage to get, you're, you're pulling many different types of heartstrings at this, or hopefully purse strings too, at the same time. So that's, that's one of the pitfalls of looking at a brochure like this. On the other hand, because they're speaking to so many different audiences, they're really opening up many different aspects of what Ohel Sara was. So one of the things that I discovered about Ohel Sara, which is not in the brochure, what's interesting is not only what is in the brochure, but what's not in the brochure. So one of the things that's not in the brochure, I was actually quite interested to see, is that the whole idea of starting um, not a teacher's seminary, but Judith, a- Judith, I wanna clean it up, you go rest. <laughs> Hi, Judith. That's okay. But you're, yeah. You just told someone to go rest, which I presume is not me because I'm, I'm hard at work here. So, um, okay. sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, so, the, the idea for, for, um, for Ohel Sora came from um, Bertha Pappenheim. Let's call it a, a very modern Orthodox 
German feminist who visited this the seminary, the Besiakov Teacher Seminary in 1934 um, as a member of the Besiakov Advisory Committee from Western Europe. So Bertha Pappenheim herself had a similar kind of home where she trained girls in various things, uh, occupations, especially unwed mothers, which I can assure you was not a thing in Besiakov. Um, and she said, very nice that you're training teachers, but we're in the middle of a depression and girls just need to support their families. People are starving to death, literally. There's a tuberculosis epidemic. We need social workers. It's great that you're training teachers, but what we really need is to be training social workers. Um, she didn't say, and dressmakers, as far as I can tell. So it's interesting that dressmakers are so prominently displayed. So that's one. So, so Berta Pappenheim is not in the brochure. She's not mentioned, despite the fact that-, that Would that be a fundraising technique for the dressmakers? Because remember a lot of Polish Jews, who, especially Bundes, who came to America uh, were tailors and seamstresses. So you, they, would, they would connect with that. Very interesting. I'm very glad you brought that up. So the whole issue, so one of the things is, I think we all have the wrong idea. And the reason why I say we have the wrong idea is because I had the wrong idea for a very long time about why it is that dressmaking was a significant part of Beis Yaakov culture. It was professionalized in the Ohel Sara, but it was part of Beis Yaakov culture also in the Small schools also had dressmaking, lace making, and pictures of people doing lace making. It was part of the evening programs. Dressmaking was all over Beis Yaakov from the start. As a matter of fact, Beis Yaakov started in a seamstress studio, in Sarajnira seamstress studio, which I also, the building is still standing miraculously. I was also in the building, not in the actual studio, but in the building in Krakow six weeks ago. So. Um, the the what I the image that I had in my mind that was inculcated in me um, in Besyakov was like oh she was a simple seamstress and these were simple people wrong impression what we're talking about when, when we're in the 1920s and 1930s we're already talking about a, a culture in which if you're not rich you're not buying your clothing from a seamstress. Get the word seamstress out of your mind. We're talking about high-end dressmakers. The only people who are at least upper middle class can afford high-end dressmaking because there are already lots of factories in which you buy ready-made clothing, which is cheaper. Now, factories are also a Jewish business all over the world, right? So we know Bundism, Shelley was talking, I think it was Shelley. Shelley was talking about, um, you know, the Bundists and people who organized the dressmakers and, and the factory workers and the sweatshops. What Besyakov did was provide not a simpler traditional, in some level, a simpler traditional version of uh, people who work in factories. Anybody could get a job in a factory. You walk into a factory, they put you on a machine, you get trained in a day. What Beis Yaakov was providing was hours, a year of training. It took a year of training with, uh, from nine to one, I, I think I forgot to show you the schedule of the day. So from nine to one, if you were learning dressmaking, every day, uh, five days a week, Sunday through Thursday, you had dressmaking lessons, um, techniques of lace making. Um, and what this did is it meant that you could graduate with a sewing machine, which you know was a real investment, but it was your only investment. Your a sewing machine and a spot in a dressmaking studio, and then you could make your own living as a dressmaker. Now, why would Besyakov and Sarishnir want girls to be able to make their own living as independent contractors, as dressmakers, rather than do what they could have done without Ohel Sara, which is walk into a factory and get a job in a day as a factory worker. Why would they want to encourage that? The reason is that they can do it from home at any leisure time and not to go to a factory 
the, to be involved with men or whatever it is. That's one of the reasons. What the about Shabbat? Shabbat. You the guys thing. have it exactly right. Those Shabbat. are the two reasons. If there, those are the two main reasons. There's a third reason if somebody wants to guess. So they Economically. Can so economically. Okay, four okay. reasons. You can make a better living as a dressmaker, lace maker, whatever, than factory labor. You would not be subject to, forget just being around men, you would not be subject to sexual harassment. There were entire um, uh, Jewish organizations dealing with the unwed mothers who got pregnant in factories. Um, or you know, with the factory manager, and there was Shabbos desecration. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the things that was one of the main political aspects of um, the Poale Agudas Yisrael, the socialist wing of Agudas Yisrael, was to try to persuade Orthodox factory workers to close on Shabbos because many of them figured out halachic ways to stay open on Shabbos, despite the fact that they had Orthodox factory workers. So Poale Agudas Yisrael, this say, I have photos, oh, I should have given you the photo. I have photos with a bunch of men with sewing machines for the same reason, so that Orthodox Jews could set up their own small tailor factory, non-factory clo clothing making operations and not have to deal with Shabbos desecration and sexual harassment or sexual, you know, fun and games, whatever you want to call it, in the factories. And then the last reason is that factories were also places that workers organized. And um, that's where communism happened, that's where Bundism happened, etc. Orthodoxy preferred um, to not participate in the proletariat if it could avoid it, despite the fact that in the 1930s, it was a widespread proletar. What, what's uh, I'm not going to be able to say this word, proletarianization right. of the ortho. Oh, look at that! I managed to get it out at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, I'm a professor. You got to say these words occasionally. So, um, so for all those reasons, dressmaking was to be preferred. So I hope you understand that that dressmaking is not because they were simple backward Jews but it, because they had certain um, cultural aspirations. So um, there's one other thing that I wanna say, which I think is interesting and important, which is that Ohel Sara is, uh, deals with uh, certain kinds of economic, socio-cultural economic development within the Orthodox community, including the delay of marriage. So basically what Beis Yaakov and Ohel Sara is um, responding to uh, are responding to is that what we have is this new period of life, which is the period of life in which we're finished with our education, which in the case of Poland, um, interwar Poland, unless you were part of an intellectual elite and went to a gymnasium, which was not encouraged for Orthodox girls, um, you were done with school by the age of 13, 14 or 15. And marriage was um, increasingly being delayed in the Orthodox world. It's, I think there's a little bit of a reversal of that effect now. Um, and by the way, all of these are issues that are still alive in the Orthodox world, which is what kind of, um, what kind of occupations should, should girls and women have? And this is really uh, very controversial within Beis Yaakov. What, especially since, um, women are now often the sole or main breadwinner of the families where the, where the men are expected to quote unquote sit and learn. That wasn't the case in interwar Poland. There were very few of these, you know, places where married men would just learn Talmud. Um, people didn't have that kind of luxury back then. It was, a, it was a vanishingly small elite, but women were still considered very important. I mean, in places where under such economic stress, um, and anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism also plays a role in um, within uh, the, the, the Ohel Sara and Orthodox culture. But in this environment, you basically have to figure out what girls are going to do between the ages of 15 and 20. 
Um, how are you going to keep them off the streets? How are you going to keep them out of the communist revolution? How are you going to? So Ohel Sara, among other things, it's actually the first thing that in that in that Yiddish article about w which is the one that's directed to the parents as opposed to the rich Americans that talk about the threat of the Polish Jewry is under. Um, the string that they pull for the parents is the question of what are you girls going to do? How are you going to keep them off the street? Send them to us and they'll learn a useful trade. And then Sarah Schneerer, who herself is a dressmaker, um, and she says, and what's so important is not what happens Sunday through Thursday, but Shabbos. How much joy, how much Shabbos joy there is in Ohel Sarah, which tells me that those girls didn't go home for Shabbos, they stayed there. And it tells me that Sarah Schneerer was kind of, she was subcontracted to make sure that along with earning a living, they were also um, being filled with a kind of enthusiasm for, for traditional Judaism. Do you, um, think, do you think that the extermination that you mentioned before yes. was in fact a Chilul Shabbat sort of thing? Oh, that's interesting. That's not, that wasn't my guess. Um, and I don't think that the, to American Jews who, were their main source of income. In other words, most of the money for Beis Yaakov came from American Jews. And most of that money came from what can only be politely called Sabbath desecrators. So the idea that these people would write, even Orthodox Jews, right? People would go, you know, people would go to shul on, on, on Shabbos morning and then they'd go to work. Um, uh, or people that were then considered Orthodox Jews Figure, you know, basically felt that they couldn't give up one day of work, especially because it it was illegal to to open your store on Sunday in a lot of places. So Sabbath desecration was not something that would be, you know, a major issue to raise with American Jews. So that's one issue with that particular interpretation, though it's it's an interesting, maybe that's a translation from something. And also Dr. J. Schlosser, what I think is being referenced is Polish anti-Semitism. I just want to say one thing. I know later on, I know from my own family experience in Hungary, when they felt the anti-Semitism encroaching, young educated girls were given, were sent to vocational programs because they thought that would be helpful to them to in saving their lives, that they would have some skill, whether it was hat making or or corset making or things, things of that one. I just heard a lecture about Judith Lieber, the very famous, very successful pocketbook designer. She was from a very upscale home in Budapest, but when things got, you know, they felt things encroaching, they sent her to study pocketbook making. And oh my God, yeah. Cool. So. Beautiful. So that's interesting. Helena Rubinstein comes from a, you know, Polish Jewish home. So a couple of things, certainly a means of survival. It, they say that right off the bat, that we're talking about survival here. These girls have to figure out how to get tools of survival um, within an economic environment in which A, Jewish products are being boycotted, Jewish stores are being boycotted, B, Jews are being considered, Jews are being tarred uh, as denigrated as unproductive, right? They're merchants, they're whatever, they're not artisans. And that's what the, the term productivization is a way to combat anti-Semitism and C, Anti-Semit, one of the things that was taught in Ohel Sarat was um, um, uh, bookkeeping. Now, one of the reasons why this is so interesting is that th this was a job for big stores, right? A little store, you could do it on the back of an envelope um, for big stores and also for factories. So, and my mother actually um, worked as a bookkeeper in a factory um, for, you know, basically till she was 80 years old. By the way, my mother's 100th birthday is uh, in two weeks. So I should dedicate this to my mother and I'm gonna go to Lakewood. She's in Lakewood right now and visit her. But in, in the late thirties, as ways of making life more difficult for, for Jews who were considered to be, they didn't know Polish, they didn't, they were, their bookkeeping was, what's the word, fishy. Um, there was a kind of prejudice, I don't know if it was entirely a prejudice, maybe it was partly true, that Jews were not basically keeping the books. 
They didn't know Polish, they didn't pay their share of taxes. Suddenly all these laws came into being that said that you needed a certified accountant or bookkeeper to keep your books. And suddenly the Orthodox world is, you know, desperate for certified bookkeepers who are of their own, right? They don't want to hire some, you know, college educated bull to come into their business and sniff around. So Beis Yaakov was also providing a direct um, response to certain, what could be called anti-Semitic economic new rules about um, Jewish businesses. I mean, they weren't just directed at Jewish businesses, but they were ju directed at Jewish businesses. Uh, that's what motivated them to a large part. So this is sort of the background of Ohel Sara. I don't know if I have any time, like in five minutes to talk about um, Tuba Av, do I? Or should we take questions or? Sure, no, you have uh, at least 17 minutes left. It's only 1.43. Okay, so if, it, if, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to totally jump to a different topic and tell you what the more middle... So, so, so Ohel Sara really um, delivered for the working class of Orthodox Jewry. Now, the girls that tended to be, come from more upper middle class families were the ones that were attracted to the business of teaching, the more intellectual, the more, um, and those are the girls that spent the summer in the mountains for four months. They were in the mountains of um, uh, the, in the south of Poland. They're called the Tatra Mountains, and they're incredibly lovely. If I knew how to take pictures, off my phone, I'll figure it out today. I would have shown you my own pictures of it. But let me show you, let me share my screen and show you. Um, I already showed you the photos of the town that they spent time in. in the next town over, we have a, um, a, a blow by blow, minute by minute description of what was done on Tuba Av by the girls in this mountain, or not in this mountain town, but in the next town over, when they went for a hike and um, at midnight on Tuba Av. And um, let me just say that Tuba Av, the reason why I think it's so significant to talk about Beis Yaakov is because the way people usually describe the revival of Tuba Av as quote unquote, the Jewish Valentine's Day is as something that was invented by the Zionists in the 1930s. Now we happen to know, and maybe earlier in the twenties too, that within the Orthodox world, possibly because of influence by Zionism, or I would say it might also have worked the other way around, um, Tuba Av was a major Jewish holiday, um, celebrated all throughout the you know, few hundred schools in Beis Yaakov, the youth movement chapters, Everywhere in the Beis Yaakov world, Tuba Av was observed, celebrated, whatever you want to call it. There were booklets that the main office sent out with programs for what do you actually do on Tuba Av? What kind of festival is it, right? Because we don't have a machzar for it or anything like that. Um, and then we have a newspaper account of what it looked like on the ground. And I put it in my PowerPoints or selections because it's very long. So uh, this is you have, what you have to picture are these mountains in the background. These are actually the foothills of the, of, of the Tatra Mountains. You can see the, uh, a mountain in the background. They went wait. to the next, wait, I'm sorry, am I not sharing? No. You're not sharing. Uh, I was, I was yeah, also gonna to recommend. Like every day uh, Zoom and it's been a year since I've done it. Hold on one second. Here we go. So just so you get an image of what we're talking about. Um, I took, we ourselves tried to figure out which trail it was that the girls went up. Uh, we weren't able to found, find the precise trail, but there are many beautiful trails nearby and in the next town over called Skava. Um, and here's a description of the hike. Um, it, as I said, it's super long. So I'll, I just did excerpts, 115 of us, this is from 1932, 115 of us go step by step, hand in hand along the path. Frau Schneer, first among us, our guide, our hearts beating with extraordinary joy, 
we follow in the steps of our leader, our flag bearer. Sorry, this year, oops. Um, the sun is already completely gone. A star speckled sky is above us, the glow of the moon. Finally, we reach a forest. It's pitch dark all around us. The center of our group lights up campfire. We pass the word from ear to ear, a flash of light, and then it's pitch dark again. They have a real problem starting the campfire that I can relate to. Our teachers busy themselves with it. We despair, a bundle of pigs, and of twigs. They add their own life force and finally they're successful and the fire catches. Soon a large fire is burning in the center of our circle, almost like the Jewish fire, which we kept burning for so long deep in our hearts. It's quiet, no one dares to speak, to break the silence, to interfere with what we're all feeling. Who, every one of us, we're all experiencing something tremendous. You can see it in our eyes. And then someone breaks the silence, who speaks? One of the students who begins to give the talk, she speaks and then we have her whole speech, which I'm not gonna give you. And then Sarah Shanira gives a speech and we hear the familiar voice, let the children sing. And so we sing, suddenly we're so overcome with the urge to sing that no power in the world can stop us. There is none like our God. We sing quietly at first, louder and louder. You could call the whole movement, the Jewish fire, quoting this wonderful story that you've just read us. Wow. Cleanse our heart. Betaher libenu. I wish I knew what tune they sing. Betaher libenu. I think probably not that tune. And suddenly it's a fervent prayer. It continues for a minute or two. Extraordinary longing overcomes our souls. Next year in Jerusalem, we add wood to the fire, the flames leap up, we can no longer sit, we rise. And so we dance alongside us, dances our leader, Frau Schneer, hand in hand with us together. We dance, we dance, etc. cetera. Um, sorry, let me get out of here. Uh, stop share. So I hope I gave you a little flavor of this, of how Tuba'av was observed in the woods of southern Poland in 1932 by, by the way, not as a matchmaking ritual, um, but as a, an all-female women's holiday, which is what it was called in Beis Yaakov. Um, so it's 10.50, which gives us 10 minutes um, I just wanted to give you a little taste of that. If I could tell, I could talk a lot more because there's a lot of material about how Beis Yaakov conceptualized um, Tuba'av. I know you just had a lecture by Rabbi Kelman yesterday about Tuba'av. Um, let's just say that not only is there a flavor of, um, I don't know what to call this, an ecstatic homosocial um, rave. I think this is a Torah rave is what we're, is being described. Um, maybe minus the psychedelic drugs. I don't think you needed psychedelic drugs in that environment. Um, yes, yes, we know many descendants of these students. Thank you, not many, but um, we have, I, yes. As a matter of fact, I've looked at these photos so carefully that I now I see a photograph for the first time and I recognize faces. So, um, and yes, uh, the, the, the people who survived, we, there are some very well-known uh, women who later became leaders in the Orthodox world who survived and their children and grandchildren are, you know, alive and well in Lakewood and Brooklyn, and Tel Aviv, and, you know, B'nai Barak. Um, so uh, yeah, we've been in touch with some of them. Um, with, so, what, so this what, was also a socialist. I'll just say one more thing about the Tuba Av, which was that Sarshner really underlined this as a festival in which girls wore borrowed white dresses, simplicity and the equalization of class differences was very important to her. Okay, why don't we open this up to discussion? Hopefully I've, I've uh, raised some questions or excited some thoughts. All right, I have a question. I have a question. 
I bet Why don't we do Claudia and then Judith, and do I see any other hands? Okay, we'll start with Chava. Sorry, Judith, I think Chava didn't see Krista. your hand. Okay, Krista. I have go I've gone through the Bishyakov movement, straight through. I never knew that they had anything like that, and I always knew about the seminary for teachers that she had. And that not that what she was famous for? Yes, absolutely. So some aspects, what you're pointing to is how the past is remembered and what survives. Um, you know, you, the things you take with you. So Beis Yaakov in the war period is separated from us and from the post-war movement. Did you say that you went to Beis Yaakov all the way through? Yes. Where? But, well, um... Partially in Sigit, which was Hungary, and then um, towards beginning of nineteen of the forties. Oh my God, Chava, I must interview you. Please tell me we could be in touch. But I did. Um, luckily, we didn't stay long there, and I and I immigrated to Israel also on a certificate. And six, we have weeks, to talk. six weeks before Let's the talk. Germans came in. And uh, Bino, I, I, Bino, I think we've been in touch, haven't we? Your name looks very familiar to me. Um, okay, so what survives and what doesn't? So not everything survives. Ohel Sara is lost to memory, even though, interestingly enough, there's now a vocational school in Brooklyn called Sara Schneerer. Um, whether they know that they're in the path of uh, Ohel Sara, I don't know. And what the continuities and discontinuities are between the present efforts to give girls, young women, some opportunity to support a family, which by the way, was not the um, stated reason for teaching. It was to support themselves and their family, their birth families, not their families they would have with their husbands. Um, so, so that's a good question. Why it is that some things are remembered and other things aren't. Oh, yes, yes, you, I am the sideman you're thinking of, and you're right that our parents were friendly. Okay, so I think it was Judith who was next. It's, but it's Rivka Falk. Hi, I'm on someone else's computer. Oh, boy, no wonder <laughs> you look so familiar. I was like, how do I know you? I'm sorry, yeah, it confused you. Um, I just wanted to ask you, because maybe I missed and the you're first You're so small. I'm, no, it's just on the computer. <laughs> 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 What the years, and wish your mother happy birthday for me. <laughs> what you. years of Ohel Sarah, its existence were? were? Um, thank you for that question. And it's so, you know, it's funny, I, I was filming in the Beis Yaakov Seminary um, with Pearl Gluck. And it's, at one point someone said, you know, this building was only used for seven years. Um, from 1931 to 19, 19 for eight years. So it was even less in, in the case of Ohel Sara and the building and lodge still exists too, um, but it was only from 1934. And I'm not sure when the building was actually, I, from 1934 to 1935, uh, or, I'm sorry, from 1933 to 1934, it was an urban kibbutz, a hachshara kibbutz. And, um, and, and, and then till 1939, so we're talking about, what is it, four years, five years? Very short, yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to say is that this whole Tuba Shvat celebration sounds very Hasidic to me in its nature, like Braslav, you know, Breslov or that kind of thing going out into the woods for this kind of ecstatic, or even Chabad, ecstatic experience. Thank you so much for saying that. Absolutely. Sarashner was trying, I mean, was quite uh, um, forthright about saying that what she was trying to do was to create ecstatic religious experiences that she felt that the Hasidic world had perfected for boys and for men and to try to find equivalents for girls and for women. And this, I think, was the genius. I mean, what could be more? She was a genius. Yes, she was a religious genius, there's no doubt. Mm -hmm. And you know, as great as it is to sit in shul, well, maybe I'm exaggerating here, um, to have a religious experience in the middle of the night around a fire um, with silence and song and ecstatic dance, um, 
you know, she wasn't going to any, she, she wasn't welcome in any, you know, Hasidic, she wasn't going to bring 115 girls into Hasidic court. But yeah, the Rebbe's themselves were no longer doing this kind of thing. This is part of the kind of imaginary early Hasidism, right? The going into the woods with the, they were going to fancy spas when they were taking, you know, nice sedate walks in the afternoon after their constitutional. She was doing the, it was a kind. It, it was a kind of fantasy of what Hasidism was in its in its purely revolutionary pioneering moment. More than it was actually. On the other hand, it was also a little bit like what the Hasidim were doing. The town of Rapka, literally contemporaneously, so that the town of Rapka was itself a very from resort town. It was like I don't know Mountaindale or so one of those places in the Catskills. It had, you know, mikvahs and shuls and kosher restaurants and kosher, and there were a lot of people having like very, you know, and it was fancy. It was a fancy resort town, so which is the sort of place that the Hasidic Rebbe would go to. So in some ways, they were also living the life of the resort town. So Shneur also went to resort towns, spa towns, you know, Mariembad, um, right. etc. So it was both contemporary Hasidism and this kind of wild hippie Breslover thing that you're also alluding to. She, she managed to do, if you're making it up, you may as well make it all up all the way, right? It sounds an awful lot like B'nai Akiva. And the, the fact Absolutely. that the girls went, uh, got visas and went to Israel. Hachshara is a program on B'nai Akiva. So I know that from my grandfather who came from, you know, around there in Poland, used to, he was a more of a Mizrahi Orthodox Jew. Yes. Even though yes. there were Hasidim and there was a Gouda, there also in the 30s was um, Mizrahi Jews. And Thank I you think so much for saying that. Yes, absolutely. And uh, my, I already told you my father is uh, Hasidic his whole life. His Rebbe was a member of Mizrahi. So there were even Hasidic Mizrahi Zionists. Who was um, this? Yachner were, and he moved to Tel Aviv in the 30s. Um, it, it, my father's Hasidic group no longer exists. Um, my cousin is the last one with the key to a, the shtibel, which was just bought up and is going to be turned into fancy condominiums. But Mizrahi, Mizrahi was the direct competitor of Beis Yaakov. And Beis Yaakov had to work to keep up. It was a competitor. It was an influence. And absolute, but the difference was that in Bnei Akiva, they were doing it boys and girls together. Beis Yaakov, Chas Shalom. And, <laughs> but Beis Yaakov managed to, the, the absence of, of boys in their Tuba'av ceremony wasn't going to stop them from having a very good time. And, um, Yes, they were either, you know, who influenced who? It's hard to know. This is like a, someone called it a cauldron of ideas. They're all swimming in it. Youth movements, nature hikes, ecstatic, mind altering um, religious experiences that are also, um, I don't know what to call it, Jewish national experiences. This is part of the soup of interwar Poland. Um, what was the reaction of the rabbis and the rabbis to her activities? Um, you know, they, in some ways, there's a, a wide range of reactions, um, including, so on the one hand, you have the Ger Rebbe, who's a big supporter, um, but he and Beis Yaakov got into some, uh, and actually, Yehuda Leib Orleon, who was the director of the seminary in 1930, from 1933 on, took over from Thurishner, was a Gera Hasid. But the Gera Rebbe didn't want to see a lot of things. You know, in some ways it was don't ask, don't tell with, with the Gera Rebbe. Um, theoretically, they asked him what he thought about everything. The truth is that the whole pro that the Gera Rebbe was in a kind of tight spot which is that the Gera Rebbe, more than any other Rebbe, was extremely conscious of the fact, and maybe Sanz also, extremely conscious of the problem of young girls becoming not from. And the reason why he says he supported Beis Yaakov, he told his, his nephew, and 
he really supported Beis Yaakov. He was one of the biggest supporters of Beis Yaakov and his wife was super involved. Um, the reason why was he said he had over 2000 um, uh, bachelor Hasidim who had no hopes of finding a bride because the problem of young girls leaving the derech was so much worse um, than the problem of young boys. In other words, it was an economic problem. There were more girls becoming unfirm than boys. And the Gera was acutely aware. He had a real, you know, he had the largest Hasidic sect in interwar Poland. He had, he had a quarter of a million Hasidim and he had a real sense of, he wasn't one of these Rebbes that hung out by himself in, in a little room and read, you know, he knew what was going on. And he understood that he had a social problem and he understood that he had to bend to Sarsner and he did. And then when Beis Yaakov was so successful, he stopped bending. Um, so there was a real little kind of um, play going on with, with uh, Ger. And then other, other movements, Bells, the Bells and Rebbe actually forbade Sarish Nera from putting on plays. Any of you know Beis Yaakov, Beis Yaakov without plays doesn't exist. So the Bells and Rebbe, they just ignored. And fortunately for them, he just died. Um, the Munkacher, the Munkacher was a stubborn guy. Uh, the Munkacher who's in, you know, Transylvania, Oberlin, Czechoslovakia. Um, thank you, Bina. Um, the Munkacher was totally against Beis Yaakov. He called it Beis Esav, or in his accent, Beis Esav. Um, Yaakov's, um, Yaakov's uh, evil twin, let's call him. And his reason was that Beis Yaakov girls loved, everywhere it says, they, Sarah revived not only, you won't be surprised that Sarah Shneri revived not only Tuba Av, but also Kabbalat Shabbat as women's prayer. And everywhere in Beis Yaakov, Kabbalat Shabbat was done in the school by girls. And they had beautiful melodies and tourists would come to hear these girls. They'd stand outside if they were secular to hear the voices of the girls. And unfortunately in Munkach, the, the Beis Yaakov was right next door to the Munkach or Stiebel. He couldn't take it. He couldn't take that, the, not the shtibel, the, I mean, the shtibel, there was a shtibel also. So he didn't like the sound of the women's beautiful, the young girls singing voices, he considered to be a kind of evil that had come into his world. On the other hand, he had the same problem as the rest of them. And the girls were leaving the Munkacher families to join the communist party, just like they were leaving all the Sanzer and go to go to gymnasium. So he actually had to start a Beis Yaakov, but he didn't call it Beis Yaakov. The teachers were from Beis Yaakov. The curriculum was a little from her. They had a Beis Yaakov. He just couldn't admit it. So this is the game that all the Rebbes had to play. Um, they desperately needed Beis Yaakov and more or less, depending on how honest they were being and how straightforward and how clear they were on Jewish law, they made it work or didn't make it work in various ways. You were talking before about uh, dressmaking. My mother, Zuchnali Vracha, she lost her father at the age of 13. Then she went, she was one of five, very poor family. She went out to the end, to Chernovitz, to learn to become a dressmaker. Not only she made money through all her life, that actually helped her to survive Rasnistria and uh, to come back. And I am uh, her fifth child. Oh, wow, what a story. I am, my mother went to base Yaakov uh, in Chernovitz. Oh. Yes. Um, my mother was from Transylvania and uh, Torda. And my mother was in base Yaakov Seminary in Chernovitz. There were three seminaries in base Yaakov in the 30s. Um, eventually four and five, but my mother went to the, it was, uh, Krakow was number one, Vienna was number two, Chernovitz was number three, um, Bratislava was number four, and mm -hmm. Williamsburg, Brooklyn was number five, founded in 1937. So, my mother grew at the house of Steinmetz, who owned the only deli factor, kosher factory in Chernovitz at that time. Wow, wow. what a story. Yeah. 
Thank you for coming. His granddaughter and his granddaughter is the one who's taking care today of the cemetery in Chernovitz and the library and the museum. Wow. And she lives, in, she lives in Indiana. I have to go to, oh, Vienna, Chernovitz. There was always a real connection between those oh, two in, cities. Indiana, Indiana, the states. Yes. Wow, thank you for that. I see Shelly well, has a hand up, but it might be what's called a legacy hand. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I, yeah, I forgot to put my thing down, but this has been very, very fascinating. Uh, I can't help but think of um, the uh, singer, Isaac Bashevis singer books. He would mm. write like family Moscat and things like that. And it was a big problem about uh, the girls in, if the family had any money, they would send them to the gymnasium and the girls did not at all want to marry these guys. The guys would still be going to the uh, from yeshivas and they didn't want to have anything to do with them. So uh, Sora Schneer knew what she was doing. Absolutely. So the, the what you're describing is the background for the founding of Beis Yaakov. And um, the, what it was was a, uh, it, it's interesting that, that for various historical reasons that I probably don't have time to get into, girls tended to get a much more advanced secular education than boys. Still the case, by the way, in the firm world. And, um, and what that meant was that it was a crisis in attraction. Girls were not attracted to Yeshiva Bacharim. Sometimes I say that the, the Beis Yaakov, the role of Beis Yaakov was to render a Yeshiva boy attractive and appealing to a girl. Um, after she's read a bunch of novels. Um, the, the, um, the word for a yeshiva boy was an ummensch, a non-man. Uh, <laughs> Steve Bachman was called non-men. <laughs> and, you know, the Gera Rebbe was well aware of this, was well aware of the fact that girls did not find his chassidim appealing. Interesting. Even even today, for totally other reasons, I think error boys have issues, and that's what I understand because this whole uh, the whole sexual ethic today of the error um, insane, insane. So the Gera Rebbe was the most sexually savvy. If you want to call it that? I think RS doesn't know that they're not on mute. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, you people. So, so some of you don't know that there's more and more extreme sexual rules in, in some of the Hasidic groups, including Ger and Slonin, most famously. And um, the uh, and for Ger, it's particularly ironic because, and you know what it is? Beis Yaakov was so successful, it allowed them to do it. Anybody, any Orthodox woman that goes off the derech, is doing everybody a favor that stays behind. I think I've said this be before because it's partly an economic supply and demand issue. There's now an oversupply, if you want to call it that, of Orthodox women, young women, eager to marry a, a boy of the strictest religious credentials with ambitions to sit and learn. And what this means is that the community is able to extract things from the female population, including that they will do all the breadwinning, including that they will give up on things like their husbands calling them by their names. Um, this is one of the bizarre sexual rules that's uh, been propagated in, in, in Gare. So Gare is a totally different beast than it was in the interwar period. Yeah, For uh, economic reasons, I'm persuaded, and I know very little about the economy. Yeah, you know, uh, can I talk a little? Please. My mother, Jay's great aunt, was a teacher from Vienna to Krakow. She was a Beisiako teacher under. What was Sarah her name? Her, uh, well, well, her name was uh, Wallach, Kittel Wallach. And she was oh. a teacher in Krakow and other places. She also spent the summer in that town called Ravna. Ravka. Ravka, whatever it is. And we have, she's, we have her uh, notes from, uh, with uh, uh, doc, Dr. Rabbi Orlean, her notes that she took from, that he gave in the summer, the summer uh, seminars. 
Is there any way that you would be willing to digitize that for sharing well, on our website? Well, uh, I, I, I gave all the papers, all the original papers and notes are in Israel right now. Oh, uh, I have them. I have them. I've seen them. What an astonishing trove. Uh, they're in the National Library. Are they even, because my kid's sister, uh, do you know her, her, her Dasa Asulim? I don't know. Well, uh, she was the head of the archives before it became part of the uh, National Library. And so I, I, there's also in Israel, somebody has a whole thing on, on Beis Yaakov. Do you yes. know who? Um, it, Moshe Prager, uh, there's his archive, it's called Ganzach. Um, but, that's an amazing, amazing trove oh, um, so of material. Okay, Hadassah was the head, Hadassah, my sister, is the retired head of the Central Archives, which became part of the lab. And I gave, when I was in Israel, I, I had found all these things that my mother had saved. Oh, and we, we are, uh, I, I came to America in 1943, we're survivors. But, mm -hmm. um, but uh, so I found all these uh, notebooks I read and they were un unbelievable. And I There's gave entire it. plays in there. Well, Did I, you notice there's a play in there? She she covers oh, she covers my mother corresponded with Orlean because uh, right yeah Orlean was a fascinating and beautiful man who was aside I, from I, being the director of the seminary and every Beis Yaakov girl that I've ever who's ever mentioned him had a crush on him. And, and also, he, was also the, he was also a socialist, as as Elon uh, Fuchs will uh, describe in his forthcoming biography of him. And also, my mother was a daughter of uh, a uh, of a uh, the Gabai of the Shatan Rebbe from Hushatan. I don't know. If, <gasps> oh yeah. my God, a Hushatner, another Hushatner. Well, almost. J you know, J the, the, my, my grandfather, who I'm named for, ran the Hoshat the Shtibel in Toronto. He died in 1936, my grandfather. My father was nine years old. Do but, you people uh, know? Wow. Do you know that we have Hoshatners here? Do you guys yeah, know? We, that I mean, I don't know that I always call me a real Hoshatner, but, uh, or my father, or anybody. But yes, that's where our family background is. They are Hoshatner, you know. And did you know that the Hoshatner Rebbe was in the Mizrahi? Yes. He, Ushatana Rebbe, who made Aliyah to Rehov Yalik in Tel Aviv, he had told people, come to Palestine. I was, I was fortunate in 1956, shortly before he was lifter, to, to uh, visit him. It was Mot Motzei Rosh Hashanah, it was Saturday night. I came with a fiddle for my father. And I have to say, I don't speak Yiddish, he don't speak English. We spoke Hebrew together. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. I've been in, you, you, so you were in the stable, you, the, the Trump law I'm murals I'm of Versailles. I'm a Biat, like my, my Davin near Rosh Hashanah. The Kippa. best neighborhood in Tel Aviv, I have to say, that was a million dollar property full, that now. looked like a shack. Yeah, now I mean, it did. Now it did. I Davin there, 1956 Rosh Hashanah and Kippa. Wow, wow, wow. And um, my, do, do you people know the Kol Mekadeshvi, the Shatner Kol Mekadeshvi? Oh, Mekadeshvi, I, I, I thought it was, you, you sing it every Friday night. You cannot be a Kelman if you don't sing it every Friday night. But I, somebody, oh, I, I know, sang it, you're, well, you're related, related to the other Kelmans. Adat Mechalilos, Karo Harvey Miyot. Okay, I'll uh, stop here, I don't want to, but yeah, uh, we sing yeah, it every Friday just, night. Can I tell everybody a quick me. story before we go? Every yeah, people, you know, we're we're in the post uh, the postscript of the class. Everybody. By the way, <laughs> some people, some people. Ten years, yeah. So ten years ago, um, I didn't know. I I grew up without any shot in a chasidim around, other than my father and my my cousin in Tel Aviv, who had the key to the stable. Oh. And uh, ten years ago, I'm bringing a delegation of Muslim and Christian colleagues to Israel, and what am I going to do with them on Shabbos? So I had a student, Zohar Wyman Kelman, and Zohar. My like, first cousin, oh, they, uh, my, my first cousin's daughter. That's Levy. That's Levy's my first cousin. This moment, 
So I, so she says, oh, just send them to my parents. They'll be happy there. So um, I bring, you know, like two or three Muslims and Christians and, you know, to, to the, the Kelmans. And um, we're sitting there and, you know, this is Shabbos, this is the challah, this is whatever. And suddenly um, they start singing the Shatner Komakadeshvi. <laughs> My jaw just drops. So I'm like, how do you know that? And they're like, we're well, Shatner. And I go back to Berkeley to th and to thank Zohar for setting me up with this beautiful Shabbos meal. I take her out to a restaurant and I say, Zoe, you know that and Zoe's my student. I'm her advisor. I said, you know that we're both two shot in Hasidim. And she's right away. She says, you know the Komakadeshi? And in the restaurant, on top of our lungs, we start singing the Komakadeshi. <laughs> See, it's uh, beautiful. I, when, when we had our family reunion a number of years ago. I heard ago, about the family reunion. 305 kilometers. Three engine five cones. So my my kids were so excited that because everybody you know Komakadish, every family adds its little you know tweaks. It's it's not yeah, something yeah, that yeah. Just each uh, you know sing it the same. Everybody has their own harmony, and uh, so it was very beautiful. They were so looking forward to have like three hundred people singing the the Komakadish Shavit. Yeah, but the, uh, yeah, that we sing. Uh, that we, all I know right. I'm not a Kelman, but is there any chance I could get a visitor pass to your next I told, I Didn't I say at the beginning of the class, we'll invite you for um, a Shabbos as <laughs> we're slowly starting to have guests over? Not we, uh, very little outdoors. So we can have you Friday nights. We'll sing Koma Kaddish. We'll get to Toronto for sure. For sure. So, uh, oh I boy. think Hadassah. I don't know if we're getting too family at uh, this, but this is a. Uh, Dr. Nussbaum, you have anything you want to add? Dr. Nussbaum knows a lot about the family and the history. Dr. Nussbaum is a nephew, married the niece of the Bubba Varebi, so uh, who is online now, if I can say that. I hope he's not upset that I'm saying that, but I think he's proud of that. Uh, fortunately, his wife passed away not long ago. They were married uh, close to 70 years. And mm. uh, he's, uh, a, a nephew of the Bubba Varebi. But, and uh, Kershner spent, uh, I think she spent the... Uh, 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 Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur at, at the Bubbaver Court um, in the early 1930s mm -hmm. in the hope of getting but you know, this, I'm, 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 uh, you can't uh, I really have very you know I'm not at all, all Hasidic you know, what, many what comments I, fantastic Beis Yaakov but just uh, about Shatten it's not Hushatten <laughs> it really is Hushatten in Brod, Brody where my parents come from my grandparents there was a, the Hashatan, the Shatan Ashtibul, and the Chotka Ashtibul were together. They were both sons of the Vision, or right. grandsons of the Vision. And so they were together. But uh, and and I knew the Sadagara is also part of that family, yes. right? Yes, yes. They're all Freedmen's. They're all Freedmen's. Sadagara, Bayan, all these. Bayan, right. Bayan. Bayan. Oh, that was. The f somebody emailed me, you know, here privately, right? The family, uh, my father, when he, he was two, they spent a year in Dinif before they came to uh, to Canada. But they, they were born in Vienna. My father right. and four That's of his were in Vienna. Was. One was born in Toronto. I'm sorry. But they were Galician. They may have been born. There were a lot of there were a lot of rebels in Vienna. Uh, Correct. World yeah. War One. World War One. That's what sent them there. I just have to say, it's such a pleasure to hear people pronounce "hushatan" the way Not I grew up word. saying it. Because when you go to when you go to academic conferences about oh. about Hasidism, I was just in a, a conference on Hasidism in in Wroclaw. You hear the professors say, "You say hushatan," they're like they have no idea what they're talking about. No, oh, you mean hushatan, hushatin, whatever they how they pronounce it. I'm like. I'm telling you how we pronounced it. And maybe we should know, right? <laughs> All right. I think hey, Jay, that, Jay. Uh, I didn't know I was going to get a family. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Jay, yes. Jay, one more thing. Your son is my grandson's counselor. Oh, <laughs> my God. At Camp Stone. Now. Yeah. Uh, sorry. That's our, oh, my gosh. What a, what a small world. Okay. Okay. Right. right. What's, what's his name? Benaya, Benaya Aryeh. 
Okay, for the area. Okay, so uh, yeah, Zaria, they, right? These uh, it was the he was young. This is our, he was a young at the family reunion. But I mean, he was there. But uh, our older kids, the one who's getting married, please got in uh, in two in three weeks. So he was oh the one who's very very excited to come to the uh, family reunion to have three hundred Kelman singing Komakadish. You know, so uh, that's what he anyway. I so. heard about that family reunion in Israel. No, oh, yeah. no, it was in Stamford, Connecticut. No, uh, I this, heard about it. Oh, oh you heard about it in Israel. Israel. Right, right. In Stanford, when so. I said, it's so great to hear you sing Koma Kadeshvi, they said, you should come to our family reunion. There's 200 people singing. Yeah, so we had two family reunions 10 years apart. So Levy and Nami were at the first one. They weren't the second. And it's interesting. That's a whole other story. How the, you know, the, I mean, listen, my third cousin, it was uh, all my great grandfather's, his, his descendants. And I remember at the first one, they said there were, I don't know, we had over, I mean, 19 of my 21st cousins were there. And, you know, it was really amazing attendance. And the first one, it was it was very interesting. But uh, part, one of the things they had said is, I, I can't believe it's still true, but not one Kelman had intermarried in all those years. But I, I don't know how long you can keep that up for, that that's, uh, you know. But uh, <laughs> anyways, that's... Uh, uh, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a, that was a great view. And then we had a second one ten years later. My cousin Ira, uh, uh, he organized him. He's your father, your father's cousin Ira. My father, yeah, my father's cousin Ira. Well, he's related twice, you know, on both sides. Right. You know, <laughs> that. But, uh, anyways, how good? Okay. So, okay. Um, thank. I see that a lot of people. Um, <coughs> first of all, Jay, can you set me up with Chava by email? Sure. Um, or maybe Chava is still here. And a lot of people thank me in the chat. So thank you. And Hadassah has had her hand up for a while. Do you want to say anything or is that? I wanted to ask um, if you have, because I see in the Polish State Archives database, uh, the digital image of Sara Schneer's birth record. Do you have that? Uh, yes, I absolutely have it. I don't have it digital. I have it on just my phone. I'm, I'm a little backward in terms of. If you uh, want, I could put the link for it in the um the oh thank box. you so much thank box. you so 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 much i also so have cut and paste it yeah very good is there any chance that i could put my email there because sure. i don't know how to save the yeah yeah, yeah. Just, just put your email or if anybody at if if you know obviously if you don't mind we never give out emails of course when that's oh we have please give out my email yeah. I would anybody love can it. ask up uh for um i'm happy to share your email of course yes with, with, with uh your... there's my email it's it's also on the University of Toronto website, so it's not a secret. Right. Um, it's easy to find. And um, I would love to hear if anyone has more material. What a, what a. Yeah. A, I'm sorry, a, I don't want to bore resource. people with our family details, you know, but, uh, you know, that's, it's very nice. Thank yeah. You. Thank you, Reshi, for getting that started. Okay. Okay. Next All time, I forget what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Bas Yaakov in the DP camps. Another next, next week, your official title. I see, you know, always the official. Hold on, I'll give you your official title for next week. Base Yaakov and the Reconstruction of Orthodox Life After the Holocaust. That's your official title for next week. Listen, if you have more stuff, we can do other weeks. You know, it's uh, now we only have twice, but uh, you know, Rabbi Kelman, I have a lot of stuff. That's good. That's As they say, don't get me started. <laughs> do you All right. have anything it's about late. her being divorced? What did you say? How about her being divorced? That had to play into into it. That was very rare at the time. Her title, her her nickname in in Krakow, she was called the Gigetta, which means the divorcee. Oh. Yes, very um, very no. uh, rare. So uh -oh, it's this is my I, dentist. I, I think I, I have to get it. it but I'll talk about that. Give me one second. Hi, hi, hi. Could you hold on one sec? Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm I trying can't to get that. into the, my dentist. How many? <laughs> no, how, uh, a Rochelle Balavan just pointed the comment. So that's my relative on the other side, if I can say, <laughs> on my mother's side. And we're related to the, the Balavan. So it's, uh, it's a small world. Uh, but you notice her interesting comments to teaching in Beis Yaakov for, uh, for 25 years. But uh, not Anybody who, can, some of this who, stuff can, uh, get, who wants to be interviewed or is willing to be interviewed and who has information about Besiakov historically, especially before 1960, let's say, I'm so interested. And if you have, I don't know what, some, some special thing in your family archive, I would be very, very interested in hearing from you. Thank you so much. 
Okay, I, I think we'll... my website, yeah. thebasiacoproject.com. Okay, I think we can let you go. We went a lot over time. Of course, this was just, you know, we finished the formal class. So really, th thank you, everybody. We look forward to seeing you next week. And uh, thank you, everybody. And really, uh, extra thank you for the little family uh, tidbits and the, the <laughs> Okay. Yes, we're, we're related. Okay. We're Hasidically related. Yeah, there we go. There we go. We'll come over and see you.